Well, good morning, church. It really is a joy to be able to be with you again, to be able to share with you from my heart and from God's heart and from God's word. Last week I told you that God's theme for 2021 for us was the year of the Lord's favor. Just as he did in Nazareth, Jesus has announced his intention to bring the kingdom of God to us. And I can tell you that the kingdom of God is looking pretty attractive right now, especially when you look at the alternatives. <clears throat> if you're tired of what you hear and see in the Democratic and Republican parties, let me recommend a different option. The Royalist Party is looking for people who are willing to lay down their ambitions in order to promote the mission of the Son of God, the King of the Universe. And I can heartily recommend it. Well, I'm opening this year with a series entitled, God is a Good God. For six weeks, we're going to be looking at the book of Titus, focusing our attention on this idea of the goodness of God and why that matters and what it implies for us who claim to be his followers. But before I introduce the book of Titus, let me tell you a little more about the title of the series. And I should note that it's quite possible that you've heard what I'm about to say from me before. This story is one that I often repeat because it bears repeating. Uh, most of you know that Mary and I attended the Mustard Seed Bible Study when we were in college. And that Bible study soon grew into a new church. And our pastor was a KU professor of civil engineering from Holland named Nick Willems. Nick had no formal theological training. <clears throat> in fact, he didn't really want to be a pastor, but he felt compelled by God to do something to help lead this growing fellowship. Let me pause just there. I just realized something. Guys, I forgot to put my slides in there. They're on the flash drive. You can just drag them over to there. Um, <clears throat> if you can find that, I apologize for that. I apologize to you because you missed the, the great pictures that started us off. Uh, I was telling you about our pastor at uh, the, the mustard seed. His, for our first pastor, his name was Nick Willems. Uh, Nick's sermons weren't fancy. They were more like listening to a conversation or a, or a classroom lecture. He would take a passage of Scripture and explain what was important about it. Imagine that. Uh, then he would share what the Holy Spirit had put on his heart that he felt the church needed to understand and to remember and to live out. What a concept that a pastor might do that. Well, one of the things that Nick said over and over in his thick, Dutch accent was God is a good God. God is a good God. Well, at the time, <clears throat> I was a young buck. I was chomping at the bit myself to do more preaching and teaching, and I loved digging deeply into the scriptures and thinking about the meaning and the significance of God's word. And I wanted to really press into the deeper things of God. I wanted to understand the intricacies of of biblical theology. And so after a while, I started growing tired of hearing Nick say to us, God is a good God. I remember thinking to myself, come on, Nick. I love you, I respect you, but, but we know this. And you've told us this dozens of times already. Let's move on to something a little meatier. Well, years passed by, and I kept digging into the scriptures, and I took classes in the Bible and theology, and I got a master's degree from seminary, and then I got a PhD in New Testament from a different seminary, and I got into pastoral ministry myself, and after a few years of preaching and teaching and counseling and dealing with people and churches, I found myself thinking, if I could only get these people to understand that God is a good God, a lot of our problems in the church would just disappear, and I started to appreciate my friend Nick Willems a lot more than I already did because he was right. The church needed to understand that God is a good God. If you don't remember anything else I say today, which, which I hope is not the case and I really don't want you to tell me if you do, but please remember this. Everything in Christian faith, everything in the Christian life depends upon believing that God is a good God. That's why we're focusing on it as we start into this year of the Lord's favor. Because if you don't believe that God is good, if you don't believe that he's a good God, 
if you don't have deeply etched into your heart and imprinted on your mind, you will never understand what it means to know his favor. Gott is a good Gott. He is good. He is good all the time to everyone. Well, the book of Titus is a particularly rich book of the New Testament. It contains some of the most profound theological teaching and some of the most practical instruction for followers of Christ. Both of those two things are there by design. And in fact, that design itself is crucial for understanding what God is trying to say to his church through this relatively short but very power-packed letter. Paul wrote this letter to Titus, his trusted associate, whom he thinks of as his son in the faith. Titus is a beloved co-worker of Paul. He has served with Paul for at least 15 years or more at the time of this letter. And throughout all of those years, Paul had been training him to carry on with what he himself was doing, preaching and evangelizing, teaching and discipling believers, establishing churches, raising up new leaders to continue the work of spreading the gospel. So Paul is writing to Titus. Titus is someone he's left behind on the island of Crete in order to help organize and establish these new churches that Paul has started. And we will see that his letter is intended to validate Titus's authority to put things in order according to Paul's instructions. Now, Titus has been with Paul for a long time. He knew what was important for the church to understand. He knew what they needed to look like. He knew how they had to handle their corporate affairs and the services and their lives as followers of Christ. So Paul's letter was intended not just to remind Titus of what he should do. Titus already knew that. But he was intended for the church to hear themselves so that they understood that Titus was not acting on his own ideas. He was putting into practice what Paul taught the churches everywhere. And to that end, therefore, Paul's letter combines deep, important theological truths with practical instructions that are the implications of those truths. About the same time that Paul wrote this letter to Titus, he wrote a similar letter to Timothy, another one of his beloved and trusted associates whom he also regarded as a son in the faith. And he told Timothy something that I am absolutely sure he told Titus. In fact, he told all of the others in his group because it was a basic principle that governed his entire approach to ministry. Paul said, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. You'll find that in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Because the goal of preaching and teaching is never simply obtaining knowledge. Gaining knowledge is never its own end, especially when it comes to knowledge about God. The purpose for obtaining knowledge is always that we would be changed, that we would become more like Christ. <clears throat> knowledge about God must be translated into godliness. We've said it before, theology must become biography. Translated into a life that's conformed to the ways of God and characterized by that. So that personal character, lifestyle, behavior, attitudes, choices, values, all of these areas of our lives must be affected by what we learn about God. So Paul combines these two aspects in this letter, what we believe and what we do. Doctrine and praxis. What we understand about who God is and how that should look in our everyday lives, both individually and corporately. Both aspects are crucial. Because wrong doctrine leads to false faith. Believing lies has consequences. Delusional thinking produces an incoherent faith and leads to horrific actions. We can see the results all around us, and we don't have to look any further than the evening news. Wrong living also leads to false faith because it leads to hypocritical professions that have no connections to personal life. And worship and daily life can become separated, and that's a betrayal of biblical faith. I'm reading the prophet Amos in another Bible study with some friends, and he's learning, 
about the importance of that. You can't separate worship from your daily lives. Because a disconnect is a very serious thing. <clears throat> We've had to deal with that at our house recently. Because someone cut corners in the construction of our house a long time ago, stresses were introduced into the structure of our home. And over time, those stresses led to a break in the sewer line from the toilet in our bathroom. And it became disconnected from the stool. And as a result, wastewater and sewage flowed out under the slab that supports half of our house, which eroded the dirt under the slab, contributing to the house settling, leaving a giant void underneath the concrete. More stress on the structure, more water and sewage where it ought not to be, and at some point, a heat duct broke, and sewage began to collect in the heating duct. Now, we didn't know that any of this had happened. What we knew was that our home stunk. But thank the Lord, someone who wasn't delusional was able to pinpoint the source of the sewer gas that was stinking up the joint, as they say, and he discovered the source of the problem. He identified the disconnect. And we were able to begin the process of fixing the mess that was the consequence of someone else's false faith. Someone who claimed that they knew what they were doing, but who couldn't be bothered to do what was right because it would cost them. Now, I know it's unpleasant for you to hear about sewage in a sermon. I don't particularly like talking about it. <laughs> But there's a lot more at stake for you and for this church and for that matter for the church as a whole and for this nation. That disconnect in our home undermined the entire foundation of our house. And there's a disconnect happening in our country right now. And there's a lot of sewage pouring out into the culture that is undermining the foundation of our society and our nation. And you may not be able to identify the causes for the disconnect, but if you're paying attention, you can smell the stink. You can't build anything on lies and delusion. And my concern, my, my biggest concern is not for what's going on in Washington, D.C., but for what's going on in the church. I'm not surprised when politicians act in their own interest instead of the interests of the country. I'm furious, but I'm not surprised. Nor am I shocked when people who have no allegiance to Christ or biblical faith promote ideas that are not just different, but are ludicrous. I'm frustrated, but I'm not shocked. What shocks and disturbs me is when people who claim to follow Jesus, who claim to be guided by what the Bible teaches, completely abandon what the Scripture teaches in order to gain political power or wealth or some personal advantage. If the church isn't the church, if who we, if we, we who say we are followers of Jesus Christ start following our own ambitions or the causes that we think must be promoted and we compromise our faith by living disconnected from God instead of living according to the teachings of Jesus, then we are trying to do the impossible. We are trying to build the kingdom of God on lies and delusion and you can't build anything on lies and delusion. Paul starts his letter by reminding us who he is and what he is called to do. He identifies himself as a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. He isn't an activist promoting his agenda. He isn't a politician seeking favors. He's not a crusader looking for people he can recruit to his cause. He is a captive. He's a slave. Someone who is owned by someone else. God is his master. Jesus is his Lord. And he is a sent one. Someone who's commissioned with a task and a message. He's just a messenger boy. He's only doing what he was sent to do. And what he was sent to do was to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. Paul's task was to help those who responded to the gospel develop in their understanding of God, to grow in their faith, and to gain knowledge of the truth, the teachings of Christ. The truths that he taught them were essential for their faith. Without them, they did not have an authentic or a correct understanding of God. But those truths were also intended to lead somewhere, 
They led to an identifiable way of living, one that was marked with specific characteristics that were consistent with what Jesus taught. Now, there are two phrases in the opening verses of this letter that we should especially note. The first is the knowledge of the truth. Paul has no question about what the basis of Christian faith is. It is founded in the revelation of the truth that came through Jesus Christ. Because Jesus, the one who said, I am the truth, was the one who stopped Paul on that road to Damascus and transformed his life from being a persecutor of the church to being its greatest champion. And Paul understood that his commitment to Christ was a commitment to truth. The second phrase shows this same fundamental understanding. Paul refers to God's promise as the basis for our hope. He insists that God is someone who does not lie. One of the most basic, fundamental doctrines of Christian faith is that God is utterly and consistently truthful. He does not lie. He is incapable of falsehood. It is contrary to his nature. God could no more be untruthful than he could stop being infinite. So if the knowledge of God that Paul wants the church to develop is the knowledge of the truth, and that includes knowing true facts and personally knowing God who is the truth, well then it follows that our faith must not only be based on truth, but it must result in us living in full commitment to that truth. The knowledge of God leads to a path. And that path is a life in conformity to the ways of God. The the godliness that comes as a result of knowing the truth must be identifiable in those who claim to know God. It's not just some vague thing. Honesty, a refusal to embrace deception and delusion must characterize someone who knows the truth who claims the knowledge of God. So let's circle back to the beginning now. I said that the name of this series was God is a Good God. I said that believing God is a good God is essential to a genuinely Christian faith, to rightly understanding God. But there's a question that we now have to pose, because the question is this. What does good mean? What does good mean? It's simple to understand the question. It's actually difficult to answer. But that answer is immensely important. It has almost incalculable significance for our lives. Because if we say that God is good, what is it that God is? What does good mean? How you answer that question will define a great many things about your life. If I assume, for instance, that good means whatever brings me pleasure, that's what's good. Well, then my choice to pursue what I think is good will lead me on a path of endless searching for that which can never satisfy. And it could and often does result in taking me to the exact opposite of where I thought I was going. Because the pursuit of pleasure ultimately leads to disappointment and pain and tragedy. What I thought was good turns out to be an illusion. And the pursuit of pleasure also leads to destruction, either for me or for those around me. For the craving for pleasure inevitably leads to self-destructive behavior or sadism or both. Or suppose I assume that good means, well, what most people agree to is desirable. That's what good is. What most people agree is desirable. But you've got a problem from the very start right there. Because what most people find desirable is that they get their own way. So that's a self-defeating assumption that leads to a whole lot of conflict as different individuals and groups and cultures start arguing about what good should be. Democrats versus Republicans, or urbanites versus farmers, or Lawrence versus Eudora. It doesn't matter how big or how small this culture, that culture, this nation, that nation, this ideology, that ideology. If you're trying to determine what good is by majority vote, you either get anarchy or you get tyranny. 
Well, maybe you try to define good as whatever brings the most benefit to the most people. You know, the name of that school of thought is utilitarianism. You know, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Well, it sounds logical. It sounds reasonable. Unless you're one of the few. Our second president, John Adams, said this. Mankind will in time discover that unbridled majorities are as tyrannical and cruel as unlimited despots. Unbridled majorities are as tyrannical and cruel as unlimited despots. See, Adams understood what far too many in our country, especially among our elected legislators, do not understand. And that is that without a commitment to truth and virtue in pursuit of the common good for all, the body politic can quickly and easily descend into factions vying for power in order to assert their dominance over the other and secure their own benefits at the expense of the rest. And it happens all the time. There's an inescapable follow-up question as well, and that is this. How do you know what is good? By what measure will you determine how to calculate goodness? Will you go by feelings? What makes me feel good? Well, that's what's good. I can tell you that the end of that road is a needle in a junkie's arm. Or a riotous mob attacking and looting a mall or your home or the Capitol. Perhaps you will use personal preference. Well, this is what I like. This is what helps me obtain what I want. And good, then, simply becomes another empty, elastic word for whatever behavior I want to engage in. Anything and everything may be justified, and no one can contradict whatever I do. For good is defined solely for me, for my benefit. I'm sorry, it's defined solely by me, for my benefit, by whatever shifting standard I choose. You go down this road, and you'll find a whole lot of fellow travelers all of whom think that nothing matters so long as I get what I want, so long as I win. Or perhaps you revert to majority vote. Good is whatever the majority says is good. By the way, the red circle on the slide is the one individual in this group of Germans who is not giving the Heil Hitler sign to the Fuhrer. Is good whatever the majority says is good? If so, it changes every election. And the right to define good is reserved only for those who will pay enough to win the election. And we're right back to the problem of the tyranny of the majority. Not to mention the ever-present problem that the majority could be fools or monsters. A mob might be in the majority, but do you really want to depend on the judgment of the mob? None of these ways of defining what good means or determining how to know what good is has anything to do with what Paul tells Titus. Something that, by the way, Paul assumes that his readers will understand. Paul knows that good is not an elastic term to be bandied about and loaded up with all kinds of nonsense. Paul knows that good is defined by God's nature. God is a good God is not merely a statement about God being kind or God being generous. Of course he is both of those things, and it does mean that. But God is a good God tells us that God defines what it means to be good. Good is not an abstract category of qualities that changes from person to person or culture to culture. Good is completely dependent for its meaning on the person of God. He is perfectly good. And therefore, whatever conforms to his nature is good. In other words, if we want to understand what the word good means, if we want to understand what good looks like, what constitutes goodness, goodness, 
We have to measure it all by looking to the one who defines what good is. We have to look to God, to the one who does not lie, who is utterly and absolutely and eternally true. We have to look to him. God is the only measure of goodness that is true. The only measure that can stand up to the test of reality. And therefore, knowing God is the only way to know what is good and what good is. Some clever person put it this way once. Good minus God equals zero. Good minus God is zero. To know what is good we must first know God. And in our knowledge of God, we will discover what good is because God is a good God.